this is the Ford Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, we're excited to be back at the Henry Ford today. This is our second episode joining the Henry Ford, and we're really thankful to them for hosting us and giving us a chance. We're welcoming Deb Reed with us today. The larger episode is about how to use a scythe. We'll go outside in a little bit with historian Brian James Egan, but before we do, Deb is the curator here of Agricultural and, and Environmental mm -hmm. Studies, is it? That's, yeah, it, Agriculture and the Environment. Agriculture and the Environment, well, so we wanted to talk with Deb a little bit first about what role the scythe had during the Civil War, and I guess, Deb, let's start. When we're on a manually operated farm before tractors, mm -hmm. what role does the scythe have? cutting grains, cutting hay. The scythe uh, and sickles too, farmers use sickles, uh, different field areas and different, uh, different grasses. But by the time of the Civil War, they've got grain cradles on scythes, so they have uh, tools that are specially designed just to cut the grains, hand cut the grains. Okay, great, and you bring up a good point. You say hand cut the grains. Uh, of course, when we talk here at the Henry Ford, you guys are always talking about innovation, and we've got a chance today to talk a little bit about that. Talk with me a little bit about what's changing in farming as we reach the beginning of the Civil War. The, there, there are two wheat belts. There's one in the south, so the Chesapeake and Virginia into the upland south are areas of heavy, heavy wheat production and all hand labor, and a labor that did not depend upon the slave. So they had debates from the 1830s, 40s, 50s, whether or not they needed to retain slaves in wheat production areas. In the North, of course, they're trying to figure out how to make labor less expensive as they harvest, because it's an incredibly labor-intensive crop, but only for very short times of the year. So it, the planting season in the late fall when they're preparing the soils and then again at the harvest they needed as many people as they could get for a very uh, quick turnaround. It's interesting that the innovations of uh, reapers come out of the south so McCormick is in the Piedmont of Virginia and then uh, Obed Hussey who's the other person that innovates the reaper is in Delaware Okay. Well, you've said Hussey and you've said McCormick. Anybody who knows their way around the farm has heard these names, but you're saying a term, a reaper. Tell me what a reaper is and tell me how it relates to the scythe. So the scythe is one long blade that has to be kept sharp and one skilled human operator, always a man. I've, I've never heard of a woman having the strength to wield the scythe for a day or or more consistently day after day in the field. So there was a, a, a man that was called the, the grim, well, grim reaper, but I mean quite literally the reaper who would walk through the fields and cut the grass or cut the grains. And then behind him would come the people who uh, bound the cut grains into a sheave. And then there were people behind them who would stook the sheave. Uh, the reaper combined the operations of cutting, well, didn't combine it, they cut the grains, but then they also sometimes on a drop panel in the back held the grain until it would uh, get a quantity equal to a sheave, and then they'd drop it. And how were the reapers moved through the fields? Horse drawn. Mm -hmm. Only horse drawn. Okay, so we've gone from we've gone from one man and a scythe, which is a large knife, to a man running a horse with a reaper behind. Yes, so we so the one man that it took to reap a field with a scythe, there'd also have to be one or two people following him to rake and bind, and another person or two to stook. So the labor was no fewer than five usually. And what's the labor with a reaper? Well not too different. One man to drive the team, uh, which usually a person who was a bit of an engineer to keep the machine running, and then a person who would bind the sheaves in the same manner and stuck the sheaves. You could save a couple laborers. There's obviously a reason we moved to the Reaper. What's the difference in productivity? Well, I would say that the difference is that the labor is very expensive in the north, so northern farmers are more inclined to purchase the machine to do the work. And there have been good studies done about how much a farmer 
how, how much grain a farmer raised to make it reasonable for him to purchase the reaper in the first place. And uh, there were large scale farmers in the Midwest who had uh, you know, no questions asked, they would purchase a reaper. Smaller farmers who decided not to purchase a reaper could hire a reaper. So there's this group of middling farmers who raised maybe more than 30 acres. They could invest in a reaper, but then they also were jobbers. So they would take that reaper around and harvest other people's grains. But it's really an innovation that takes off in the North and the Midwest, especially the new wheat belt of Wisconsin, and uh, slower to be adopted in the Southern states. Gotcha. So the scythe is still being used for grain during the Civil War. What, what survives during the Civil War? Um, what role does the scythe see itself playing in the North and in the Midwest where it's not doing quite as much of the main grain tasks? Uh, small farms. So when you think about how much people could harvest of grain in uh, the, that narrow window of opportunity in the fall, they estimate that it would take 10 working days for a family of three to five to harvest 30 acres of grain. And that would be the maximum they could produce. So for a diversified family farm, you might still be using grain cradlers and you know the family. But uh, anybody that's wanting to put in more than 30 acres of, of any grain, combination of grains, would be, would, you know, legitimately determine that they would be better off investing in a reaper. So yes, the, the scythe or, and grain cradle though is used. Uh, it's used to cut into fields, so to, to not waste that area at the beginning of a field. It's used to cut around fields in certain places so that you don't trample grain. So there, were, there was a life for grain cradles, which includes scythes, after, long after the reaper adoption. Great. Well, thank you very much for the time spending with us. We're going to throw it outside and we're going to jump out of 21st century clothing and back to 19th century clothing. Well, okay, I made it part of the way to the 19th century and then we changed our minds. Look, we just had a great conversation with Deb Reed, the Curator of Agriculture and Environment here at the Henry Ford. And we also shot the second half of the episode. Jeremy worked with Brian James Egan on how to use a scythe. There's so much great episode material here that we're just going to break this up into two episodes and be honest with ourselves. So join us next time. We'll learn more about the scythe in the 19th century. I think you're really going to love it. Thank you very much for your support of the Civil War Digital Digest, whether it's hitting like or subscribing, whether it's being one of our patrons on Patreon. It really helps us so much. We're working hard to bring you content that helps you connect with the American Civil War experience. We'll see you in a few weeks.